Hey, welcome everyone to the From the Shadows podcast. I am your host, Shane Grove. And before we get started with uh, this new episode, I just want to remind everybody, if you want to, if you just can't get enough of the From the Shadows podcast, and I know there's so many of you out there listening that just are like, we we just want more. We just can't, we can't go half the day without doing or reading or, in, you know, doing something from the shadows podcast, just go to our website from the shadows podcast.com. And Nita, the social media queen has worked with Doug, our website guy, and there's connections to everything on there. You can go to our Instagram, to our TikTok, to our Patreon page to get extra content. And uh, you can become a Patreon member and get our episodes a little bit early, but all commercial free. So um, go check it out. Um, and if you really want to get a hold of me, you can go to uh, Shane Grove author on Instagram and send me a message uh, or just go to the contact page on the website and you can uh, send me an email. And if you have an, an experience that you want to share, we'd love to hear it and have you on the show. And speaking of having on the show, today's guests and I didn't know if I emphasize guests because they're plural. Um, we have a returning guest, uh, Melissa, Melissa Cooper, who, who and I can't even remember how long ago it was. She says it's over a year, but she came on and shared a couple of Bigfoot experiences she had in North Central Ohio when she was younger. Okay. Well, we have a, uh, we have kind of a special surprise. She drug her husband onto the show. She teased us way back then that uh, because they moved from Ohio out west, and I'll let them tell the story, and they just they moved onto a property that had some activity, and her husband has a, has a couple good uh, experiences he's going to share with us, and then uh, we're going to get into some other stuff. So, Gary, welcome to, the, to your first time being on the show. Melissa, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> so Gary, we've already heard everything from Melissa. So just so you want to want to explain, you know, you guys picking up, taking off from Ohio out west, where you guys went to, and then what sort of, you know, what sort of happened once you guys get out there? Um well I uh initially we went out there to kind of visit and we just fell in love with the place and uh, we didn't have much money or anything, and we ended up. I ended up getting a job and uh, getting an apartment, and we stayed out there for about thirty-five years, I think. Right? Yeah. So yeah, we came home for a couple of years in the middle of there when I was laid off from work. But uh, as soon as work came back, I jumped right on a bus and went back out there again. So. And yet you guys are back in Ohio. Well, that'll be an episode for later on as to why you came back to Ohio. Because <laughs> oh, nothing against Ohio. And it was time to just time to I drug her away from her family for ah uh, okay. Twenty five years. Excuse my language. I'll watch that. <laughs> so it's her. So it's her fault. Okay. So <laughs> so so once you get, so once you get out there, how long is it before you guys? Um, Get the pro get onto the property where I mean, is that the property that you guys went to first? We were out there about ten years before we bought a house. Um, let, well, let me see. That was like eighty six when we went out there, and we didn't buy the house until ninety nine. Yeah, nineteen ninety nine. The end of nineteen ninety nine. So. Okay, and so what? So what about this property? Did you did you fall in love with? Man, I wanted a place that was secluded, and this house was at the very end of a long, dead-end dirt road that ended in our driveway, and there were some woods out back. It was not a huge property, but about an acre and a third, and it was it was big enough, and it was uh, quiet enough, and um, yeah, we, uh, we just liked it Im immediately, and it was pretty rough when we got there, so... So, so how, so first of all, it's a pretty squatchy area, but that's probably the last thing you're thinking about. Yes. No. When you, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, you know, honestly, um, I wasn't a, a believer really. I wanted to believe, you know, but yeah, I honestly really didn't even, you know, with the no lack of solid evidence and things like that. I, I just honestly didn't, uh, didn't believe until I had my own sighting and 
and yeah, that just rocked my foundations for sure. <laughs> that now I guess you should say this was in you guys were, were in Washington, right? Yeah, Washington, Washington State. Okay, okay. So, and even though Washington is a place with where a lot of people have sightings, and you worked at, with a lot of people, nobody nobody talked about it. No, people do. People, a lot of people discuss it, and uh, I hadn't really, uh, I didn't really tell a lot of people at first. And I told uh, two of my coworkers, and word just went out through the shop, like you know, and. And uh, amazingly enough, a lot of people came to me and, uh, and with their own stories or my brother or my uncle or, you know, so there were a lot of people out there that that had experiences. It just doesn't come up often in regular conversation. So but what it, but before you had your sighting, you heard people talking about it, but you just dismissed it as. Eh. Yeah, well, I didn't dismiss it. I, I, you know, I wanted to believe, you know what I mean? I just couldn't, couldn't quite wrap my head around it, I guess. And, and we so. had the experience in Marion. Um, so there, there had been a couple of things that had us open-minded to the point yeah. where I think we both thought it's a possibility. It, it could happen, <laughs> you know, but as far as a real belief, I, I don't think Gary did. Now I did cause I had visited, I had had a sighting. But I don't think Gary did. Well, I thought I did, really, until I actually saw it. And then I was just absolutely in shock. It it uh, derailed me pretty hard for a little while there as far as, uh, man, I don't know. It was just, uh, it it's scared the heck out of me. And I'm not, not not been scared of much in my life. I've, <laughs> you know, it's a uh, strange well, let's Well, let's get into it. So, so share with everybody, like, you know about when it was and where where you were and what you were doing and and what really shook you it was in august of 2012 and i was driving home from work and it was maybe 11 30 at night and i had to go to walmart for something usually when i would go that way i would go up the back way through the military base and uh um it just walked across the road in front of me and it was quite a ways in front of me really but you know there's there was a smudge on my windshield and at first I thought it was that smudge and uh it just started walking across the the two lane road and uh man it was it was just a huge huge animal you know it was a <laughs> very large one even compared to most people's stories so 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 how how many steps did it take to get across the road uh, just a few, two or three steps, you know, to get across the road. There's space on both sides. It's the military base, and there's a dirt road maybe 100 feet up in front of it where it uh, crossed. There was a uh, a raise in the, the road there, like a hill or a ridge that runs along there that's, I don't know, 30 feet high maybe, and I that reflects in the headlights and – I could see that reflecting in the headlights behind it, and yeah, it, uh, it was uh, pretty crazy big. It was. It was when I first did my initial report. I said it was ten to eleven feet tall, but I've done a lot of uh, um, construction work, and I've done a lot of. Uh, I'm a crane operator and stuff, so I'm pretty good at estimating distances and and footage. And uh, yeah, I'd say it was probably twelve feet tall. And, just Holy absolutely smoke. huge. And so did it ever did it ever look at you or did you just see it from the side? It turned towards me like its whole body turned, upper body turned, and it, I just had this impression that it was aggravated. Like like if I hadn't had my bright lights on, I wouldn't have even seen it, I don't think. But uh, there was a headlight out on the car at that time, so I had my bright lights on and uh, just lit it up pretty good. Huh. How how much of the of the face were you able to make out? It was probably 400 feet in front of me, so I really didn't get a great look at the face. The face was darker. Um, this was like a uh, uh, kind of a reddish brown Bigfoot, and uh, yeah, I really didn't see the face in much detail. So, it was but it was for me at that point. 
but it was enough that you knew that it wasn't a human at all. Oh no. man, dude, no, there. This was not a bear, not a human. There was nobody in a costume that big, and uh, yeah, that there was no question there. You're willing to go on record to say that Shaq was not out. <laughs> oh man, with. not even close. Yeah, it. Your brain goes through this category process where you try to put it in a pigeonhole with something and. I just went through all these things it could be, and I kept coming to Bigfoot, and I just didn't want to even think that for some reason. And it, uh, yeah, that was the realization that I came to that, without a doubt, I knew, I knew what it was. But your brain just refuses to accept that in a way. I don't know how to explain it, but. Uh, so, so was it coming from the military base side of the road? Um, I think it's the military base on both sides, but the, oh, okay. to the left side, there's a lot of private property out through there. That I'm thinking this is the border with the military base, but I've been told that that's the military base as well. I thought that was like, you know, privately owned property over there, but I'm really not sure who owns that property. I know there are houses up that side of the road and yeah, it just, uh, an interesting side note is that that left side of the road where it came from, now you keep going through those woods, you're going to end up on Mount Rainier. The right-hand side where it walked off to goes deeper into the military base and a river. And when I had asked Gary that night, what do you think it was doing? Because he's like, we don't have a big enough gun. And I'm like, <laughs> why, why is a gun the first thing that you think when you see it? Why would you want to shoot it? And he's like... I would. Because it could hurt me. But if, if, it, if we it's needed too to. big, <laughs> I'm not at the top of the food chain anymore. And that was a quote. I'm not at the top of the food chain anymore. <laughs> and um, so when it walked off, I said, what do you think it was doing? He said, I think it was doing something it'd done a thousand times. I said, like what? And he said, like going to the river to get a drink. Yeah, it kind of looked like it was a, it had a purpose. You know what I mean? Walking forcefully, kind of. And you were just in the way because you you know and if you th i mean think about it. if you you said yourself you're on your way home from work and you had to go to walmart so you were probably going away right that you didn't normally go this was a mile from walmart in spanaway at, at most maybe maybe two but i think about a mile from spanaway walmart and pretty pretty populated area that close to town i was uh yeah i was oh. stuck in the state of disbelief for a bit <laughs> And so you couldn't, so you couldn't wait to get home to tell, tell Melissa then, right? Honestly, I didn't say no. so. I, I, I came in and I was, man, I was upset and I don't know uh, how to explain it very well. I was, uh, I was kind of in shock, I guess. And I sit there for an hour and, you know, we've had quite a few crazy things happen in our lives. And for some reason, I didn't want to tell her this one. And she, we sat there for a while and. <laughs> uh, well, he come in in a mood I had never seen before in my life. Like, you know, you've been married. We've been married now 40 years. You've been married that long. You know every nuance, right? Mm -hmm. And finally, after an hour, hour and a half, I said, so you want to tell me what's bothering you? What's wrong? And he didn't want to. He hesitated. And he's like, it's too crazy. I can't You're even not even going to believe this. I said. And, and he goes, you, you won't even believe me. I said, try me. Let's hear it. And he said, he just blurts it like, almost like it's a dirty secret. Like, <laughs> like he's embarrassed. He's like, I saw Bigfoot. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Go ahead and call me a liar. I saw Bigfoot. <laughs> and then I realized what it was. The mood that I saw was fear. I'd never seen Gary afraid in my entire life. In 40 years of marriage, <laughs> I'd never seen him rattled ever. <laughs> he was rattled. And he has not been back to the woods since then. Nope. And I, I'm ashamed. <laughs> I'm ashamed of that too. You know, I was always the kind of person we would go camping in places where you wouldn't see a car for three days. Right. You know, and no, no road, no tent. You nothing but the tent. You know what I mean? Hardly at all. And and uh, and, and you saw this from the car. You know what I'm saying? Like you weren't yeah. even in the woods. No. See, you saw this from the car. Holy smokes! That. The fact that something that big could be that close to a populated area and my brain just raced with everything, the possibilities. I, uh, the, one of the first realizations I made, is there's gotta be a breeding population. It's not just that one. And, uh, I, well, I, 
things that happened at our house came back and that just gave validity to all, you know, we'd had a lot of crazy things happen just in the little woods we had behind us. And I had been telling Gary for years, we have a Bigfoot living in our woods. <laughs> and he did the same thing to me I did to my kids, so I can't even blame him for it. It's a coyote, it's a bear, it's yeah. it's a mountain lion, it's this, it's that. Uh, I grew up in the woods in Kentucky. I'd heard all these animals, visually seen all these animals. That's not what it was. And I think that day, that it all crashed in on him at once. That yeah. all this stuff we'd been hearing and, and stuff like that, that. That was all interesting, but when it, at the time, I was just like, ooh, that's crazy. And But then actually laying eyes on this thing is, uh, wow, that could be out back, you know. <laughs> well, there you go. That's that is that's the difference is, yeah, you had a sighting driving down the road, but you've also had stuff going on in your house and you were able to write it off until until yeah. just until just that. Now, did um, did you did you ever see anything, Gary, at the house? No, but we sure had a lot of crazy experiences sitting outside at night. And uh, we used to like to just sit outside and, you know, have a drink and sit out there and just relax and enjoy the evening. Because there's owls and all kinds of things out there, you know. And uh, it was, uh, yeah, we've had a lot of things happen there. Um, that's why I wanted Melissa to sit in with this interview because uh, she could remember things I didn't and vice versa. And yeah one of the things that happened out there that first brought it up as to be a sasquatch was i went out the back door and she'd been out there for a few minutes and i heard this big deep like a like a howl you know and i was like i stopped and listened and i'm like man that's a what is that i said I, first thing i went through my mind was a train and then i thought well no it's the fire siren from town and then I thought, like, a, it's like a thousand Kawasaki r ripping it off, going down one of these roads out here, you know, that one. And uh, it just went on and on and on. And it was so deep, you know, you could feel that. And it was a ways away when it when we heard this, but you, you had the impression that it was something huge. And at the end, it kind of cycled up into this primal scream from that howl, kind of, to, to like a primal scream. And I had just walked around the corner of the house and I was like, oh, my God, did you hear that? Because that was a set of big lungs and vocal cords because it went on impossibly long. And he was saying, it's the Roy <laughs> Rodeo, it's this, it's that. And I went, nope, it's that Bigfoot. And he goes, no, I know what it is. It's the fire siren. And I went, nope, it's that Bigfoot. And at the very end of that how it went, Rah! like, well, I can't even mimic it. No, yeah, not there's no way close. to mimic it there's at no all. no way. Yeah. And Gary went, that's a set of lungs. I said, that's a set of lungs. I said, now you tell me. Is that a bobcat? Yeah. Nope. Is that a lion? Oh, bob nope. Cat. Is that a bear? Nope. <laughs> so, so when you so when you went into work then and finally started telling people, what was what was some of the reaction and some of the stories that you got back from people? Um, well, I had a, a a friend who was my lead man at work for a while, and he was an ex-military uh, chopper pilot and uh, he was he's an avid hunter and uh, he hunts with like handmade bows and a uh, primitive bow hunter I guess you would call it and uh, they found a place two hours from the road and they found a freshly freshly killed deer that was torn in half with the it was twisted in half with the haunches and the lower the rear end gone and the front and the gut pile still there and it was so fresh, the flies hadn't even gotten to it yet. And uh, they they ascertained that it was actually still very warm, like it had just happened. And, uh, yeah, they beat it out of there with quickness because they didn't know what could do that. There were no teeth marks, no claw marks. It was just twisted in half like a dish towel, he said. So, and he's out there with a handmade bow. Yeah. <sighs> Better, I better shoot it in the eye. A, a couple people that lived close to us that had sighted it that same night. Um, that same night. Uh, oh, yeah. Remember? Um, yeah, a kid at work, uh, they had just bought a house half a mile down the road. Oddly enough, that that was 
right next to Muck Creek, which is where Mike's yard is. The the Mike guy you had on the other yeah. day, Mike. Uh, um, his last Mullen, name's Mike escaping Mullen. me for a second. Mike yeah, Mullen. yeah, Mike Mullen. And it was across in that same creek, and uh, his dad was coming home, and uh, they saw a big Sasquatch that was in that creek doing something, you know, like it was down there bent over doing something. And his dad and his girlfriend both saw it when it was separate sightings. By. Yeah. Two separate sightings. And so you guys think it was the same one that you saw? I really don't know. You know what I mean? I have no yeah. way to really know, but he, it sounded similar. And there are a lot of sightings. The, the BFRO investigator that came and interviewed me, uh, we went for a ride and I showed him where it happened at. And he said he had a, he had permission to hunt and had a, a deer stand that was like a half a mile from where we were at that, that he said, uh, he got had his first sighting that sounded like the exact same creature that, uh, was with, within a mile of where mine was. So it was on rice, rice candle road or something like that out there. And the creek that his, uh, co-worker saw it at would you say it was a mile and a half two miles from our house yeah. as well and he had a bunch of um dots on a map of sightings and i said why are these dots in my woods these are my woods why are, why are there so many red dots in my woods and he said the guy behind us people behind us saw him coming out of our woods and i and that's when i said to gary i told you there were bigfoot in our woods i told you <laughs> And so that's when you decided to move back to Ohio. That yeah. Oh, no, that was year, many years later. Yeah, yeah. no, we, we toughed it out. But I'll tell you, we abandoned the woods. Now, um, yeah. that doesn't sound like much, but my kids had a fort out there. Uh, we had a clearing out there. I made, made paths. So yeah. You could get out and walk around the property. And we had walking paths all at once. And let's see, there was five of us living in the house at the time, my brother included abandoned the woods we got scared out of the woods nobody wanted to be in the woods anymore it was like something creepy had moved into the woods that's that's it was a feeling nobody wanted to sleep in the back bedroom either everybody slept right. in the front side of the house and not that that makes a difference but that's just to show you the feeling yeah yeah <sighs> well i mean that's terrible you know that you have to experience something that that totally uh, takes you away from being able to enjoy something that you love to do. But I mean, on the bright side is you don't come across human beings out in the woods that have been ripped in half like you do deer. I've heard many people come across deer that are basically twisted in half. So, it, it, and people will say, well, what about David Pilates and all the missing people and stuff? I don't know. It's, I mean, David, even David Polites almost insinuates that he believes there are aliens that are taking people, not Bigfoot. A lot of yeah. people do do uh, talk about their supernatural aspect. Uh, but the thing I saw was organic meat, man. If it's if it's extra dimensional or whatever that that whatever definition you try to put on it, it was definitely solid. But <laughs> when I saw it, one of the first so. questions I asked Gary was do you think it's transdimensional and an animal, an alien? He goes, this was a flesh and blood animal of this earth. But the night we heard the screaming, we lived in a bowl. So if you can picture a volcano and we lived in the, the cup of the vol volcano. Not, not a volcano, just but, a but dip just, in the ground. You know, yeah, and, yeah. but we heard it <laughs> coming around. There's a road that goes all the way around the rim, if you will. It was moving impossibly fast. And a, a car could not have gone around that rim as fast as this thing did. And uh, one of our friends thought maybe we heard it entering because he believed it was transdimensional. And he thought maybe we heard it entering this this realm. I, I don't know. There's no way to know. Uh, yeah. But it, it did move impossibly fast. Impossibly fast. Well, think about the strides on something 11 foot tall. Yeah. I mean, it would cover anything twice as fast as a regular person just walking. Now, one of my daughters had an, a very bizarre experience herself. She was out in our driveway with her dog in the middle of the night. She yep. heard something huge. She could feel it in the ground. 
run down our driveway right in front of her face and then turn and run off around our house into the woods she couldn't see a thing. Yep. And, and she she's said, not one to make up stories. She and she came in very matter of fact. Rattled. Person. She was crying. She was scared. <laughs> and she said, Dad could not have made the sound. Whatever this was was huge. Huge. And there was nothing. She it ran right in front of her face and she didn't see a thing. Yeah. You know, and that's not and that's not the first time I've heard that either. That people are standing there and they hear something you know, walk or run or beside them in the woods, wherever. And they don't, you can't, you don't see anything. And in broad daylight, there's yeah. people that have those sightings where they know something is walking. I mean, cause they can hear it and they look and, and nothing, they can, they can't yeah. see anything. She said she could hear it. We have our property was overrun with blackberry bushes and she said she could hear it dragging those blackberry bushes that had run through the blackberry bushes with ease and like a human couldn't even get through there. I mean, they're up to your chest. You could, a human couldn't have run through there. And she said, but she could hear it like snatching onto its fur and just getting ripped out and drug along with it, mm. but still couldn't see a thing. Yeah. A human couldn't really, uh, it might run through it, but they're not, it's going to hurt. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It can hurt. <sighs> So, so let me ask you this, if a creature that size was inter interdimensional, would it make you feel any better? I'm not really sure, honestly. <laughs> uh, you know, we, like I told Melissa when I came home that night, we've had so many crazy things happen in our life that uh, uh, I wouldn't know why I'd have a hard time talking about this. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it was uh, hard to bring up, hard to discuss at first. So I think it made him feel silly. He he really thought nobody's going to believe him. He really thought that, you know, he, he would be labeled a crackpot. That's it. You're nuts. You're and crazy. I was with some with a, some. Yeah. People, and it did happen. Not really. majoritively, though. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and that is that sadly, that's what happens. And that's why people are afraid to share their experiences, because some people, no matter what, they, they're just going to give you the benefit of the doubt that something did you actually experience something, you know? I tried very hard in my life to, my word is gold. You know what I mean? If I'm, if I say something, I mean it. And um, I've tried really hard to live my life with integrity as much as I possibly could. And so, yeah, it was kind of weird to talk about it. Knowing people aren't going to believe it, you know? So now that you're back in Ohio, does it make you, are you still have the same feelings about the woods? Maybe not so much, honestly. And, and Ohio's got a lot of sightings too. Um, they don't seem as big. We're, we're in the they city don't... now, so it's kind of a different thing. But Well, the ones in Ohio don't seem as big as the ones that you see out, that people report out on the West Coast. I mean, the ones out there seem like, you know, they're all on steroids or something. You know, there must be... This thing looked like a steroided out, uh, like Lou Ferrigno in his prime, but 12 feet tall and shoulders five feet wide. Just from the front of its chest to the back, it was a good three and a half feet or more thick. It was huge. Well, I remember one time, I was at the uh, Schwarzenegger Classic back in the early 90s, and I turned around right into Lou Ferrigno. Okay, into his chin. And I'm not a little dude. I'm six, I'm six two, you know, 265. He, I felt like Lou Ferrigno could have just picked me up by the top of my head and <laughs> sent me out of his out of his way. So I can't imagine, and I don't think Lou Ferrigno's six eight. I mean he's like six four, six five, but he just is so massive at that time. And that was when he was uh, making his comeback at the at the master universe, Mister Universe of the Masters division, he's just he is just ripped. And when you see people that are that big, and then you're trying to imagine something two or three feet taller, five hundred pounds heavier, you you just can't even can't even wrap your head around it. You know, yeah. Um, and, and, and and so I hope I hope I hope it doesn't scare you to go out in the woods here in Ohio. I mean, that, 
maybe I, the, I'm going to be a little better about it. The, it's more civilized place here. Washington is just you can get out there, like I said, and you don't see a car for three days in in places, you know. Well, and and people that that kind of poo poo the idea that anything like that could exist, they don't understand that there's places like that in the United States that are so remote. A lot of places. Yeah. Yeah. Well, especially, especially, I mean, but there's remote places here in Ohio that people don't get to on a very regular basis. So it, 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 I just think that people, you know, don't have open minds. And if they don't understand even that fact, you're never going to be able to um, believe that that, you know, that something like that exists. So, um, what, so what, so we're going to segue into the big guy, into, I want to hear about your haunted house. Okay. Uh, Mm -hmm. we talked, we talked a little bit about, you know, some stuff that was going on. I want to hear the whole story because, uh, some of this stuff really gives me the willies and, uh, even more so than, than 11 foot ape out there running around in the woods i gotta be honest with you You've probably driven past that place if you've been around around marion at all i know you're only what 30 yeah. miles yeah. away from there yeah yeah if, what if you take the loop and just go around town it's on the east end of the loop on that little side street okay uh, and that's not the only place but it's those big mansion type houses on the right hand side that are made into apartments and Okay, so you're talking the ones that end up going up. behind behind the hospital, like over on the hospital side of town. No, if you go I'm talking about if you take the loop in town that Church everybody Street used to, to cruise, center. yeah, you go up Church Street past the library. Okay, the American City La- Library. You take a left. That's what they called the loop, and that's Sergeant Street, and it loops you back onto Center Street. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. Or you yeah, can take the right and go on out, but um. Yeah, that's where it's it's well, located. When when uh, all that started happening, man, I was a complete atheist. I was like 19 years old. I didn't believe in God any more than Easter Bunny, and and uh, I didn't believe in ghosts. I didn't believe in any of that. I thought it was all just complete crap. And <laughs> but Melissa's had a, a spirit experiences her whole life, and her yeah, she's uh, got a long history of that stuff. And so I think that the fact that she can see them or hear them and and stuff maybe draws them to her i don't know but uh um that at that point i was working nights and melissa was getting all all uh vocal about this and i've i she's got her diary she actually uh pulled that diary out here a while back and we went through it and reread all these entries and she's like he won't believe me and you know um <laughs> i cannot make him believe and and uh um yeah i uh was working nights and she had a friend come stay the night with her because there was a bunch of stuff happened with just one day and uh she had a friend come stay the night with her and the the friend actually took off at four o'clock in the morning and walked home and um yeah there was a uh, quite a bit of stuff there that was if you want to go ahead and tell them what happened that night and um <laughs> My girlfriend came over to spend the night, but uh, she didn't believe in ghosts either. And we, uh, I had told her that Gary was at work, and we're sitting on the couch, and she goes, I thought you said Gary was at work. And I said, he is. She said, no, I just saw him walk past your bedroom door. My there bedroom was, door. There was frosted glass in the Yeah, door. you could kind of see <laughs> through it. And I said, there's no one else in the house. She goes, Melissa, I just saw it. And I said, I'm telling you, there's no one. So I took her in there, showed her nobody's in there. She sees it again. And she goes, well, can you turn the lights off so I don't have to see it? And I said, just give it a minute. The lights will shut off on their own. And, of course, a few minutes later, they did. And she that, that startled her, but she still didn't quite believe. Well, we started hearing a baby crying up in the attic. Now, it was December, uh, January. I know there's no baby up in the attic crying, but I'm going to take her up there and show her there's no baby in the attic crying because she's concerned about the baby in the attic. Well, listen, that is how... About fifty percent of horror movies start. Right. Yeah. We're gonna go. The, the, oh gosh! If you know there's no baby in the attic, don't go in the attic. Okay. I was harmed. <laughs> I was harmed. But we go out there. Of course, there's nothing there. 
We get back to the apartment and now we hear the baby crying from the bedroom. I know there's no baby in the bedroom. We get up, we go look, there's no baby in the bedroom. We go back in the living room and sit down and she goes, what is going on here? And I said, Angie, my house is haunted. And just then the baby started crying on the couch in between us. That was it. She was done. She jumps up, runs out the front door. I run after her. We go over to Danny's Pizza or something like that, it was called. And she called her dad to come. Oh, I thought she Yeah, she actually called her dad to come pick her up. (laughs) I wanted to go home with her, but they were Mormon, I believe. And he said that in their religion, it was improper for me, a married woman, to go spend the night in their home. So they wouldn't let me. He wouldn't let me. So I had to go back up. And about the time I went to try and fall asleep, all hell broke loose in the house. And so I got up. Everything in my house that could be opened was opened. Every jewelry box, door, See closet, that horror door, stories too. cupboard, you know? front door. My windows were all open. Yeah, it's, the windows would open in the middle of the night. And then we'd get up in the morning and there'd be an inch of snow on the carpet in there and and these had big counterweights in the wall. They were old windows that, you know, they come up yeah. really easy because there's a counterweight and they make noise. And I'm a super light sleeper. And I never woke up when those windows opened. It happened several that's times. That's even in my diary. I guess the counterweights did it because that's what he kept telling me. It's the counterweights. <laughs> the counter- maybe, <laughs> maybe, it was the, maybe it was the baby. Yeah. <laughs> And so uh, there was an old lady and an old man spirit there. I'm and sorry, so um, at, at any rate, I ended up <laughs> when all that happened, when everything opened up, that did it for me. I was scared myself. So I was so scared. I ran out of the house in a thin jacket, not even a winter coat. And this is winter in Ohio. And Gary's old ca- uh, work boots that were sitting by the bed. <laughs> I went clomping out on the front step. And I sat there till six o'clock in the morning when he come That's home. That's where I found her at. And she was not a happy camper. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not going back up there and you can't make me. Where he walked in and seen it like that. And he just closes everything up. I don't know what was going through. We didn't mind. have the money to move. Yeah. You know, my grandma helped us get the apartment. I, we didn't have the money to move. I was, you know. And um, <laughs> it was either that night or the next night that it happened with Gary home. So yeah. Gary got to witness it firsthand. And that's when he started believing that something's not right here. So so what all did you get to experience, Gary? The same and, uh, like, one day I had several friends over and uh well let me start at the beginning, I guess. When we first moved in there, uh we had went to bed and um the carriage lights turned on. They're not carriage lights, they used to be get natural gas lights that you'd put a mantle in back yeah. in the day but they had electricity ran through it and uh those lights turned on both of them and it's like they don't work by a switch somewhere you have to physically turn the key that would have turned the natural gas on and there's an audible click you know each one has to be turned on and they both turned on at the same time and i'm like well that was kind of weird and so i got up and shut them off and they turned right back on again as soon as i laid down and i'm like that's that's kind of strange. And so uh, uh, maybe the next night or very soon after that, uh, we're in bed at three o'clock in the morning and I hear this incredibly hard slamming right on the attic floor above our head. And it sounded like somebody was hitting the floor with a sledgehammer or something. I mean, really hard. Boom, boom, boom. And I'm like, what in the hell is that? And I, I went up there and It was odd because there was only one key to the attic and it usually hung on a door, hung on a hook by the door. And uh, I went up there and that was kind of scary because the the light switch is an old string type light bulb in the ceiling that you got to pull the strings and it's at the top of the stairs, of course. So, uh, yeah, I went up there in the dark and and, uh, looked around and it's like there's absolutely nothing up there that that could have been. And the attic is divided into four sections for the four apartments. And uh, everybody's got their stuff in their little section. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, there was nothing that that could have been. And eventually, I discovered that I had an old tool chest of my grandfather's up there that he had made. It was a great big four-foot long box and maybe two and a half feet wide and three feet tall. And uh, 
eventually one time I I was trying to figure out what that noise was and I picked that box up and banged it on the floor by one of the handles on the end. And we think that's what that noise was. Something was picking that up and slamming it on the floor. And that was really disconcerting. And I'm still not really believing things too much yet, you know. Yeah, we got in an argument about it. And uh, like a, a pretty serious argument. We don't normally fight like that. I wanted And to she cussed me out and <laughs> took off. And uh, I went up in the attic. I had three beers on like a six-pack binder, you know, the, the ring binder. And I grabbed those three beers and I went up there in the attic and I just sit there on my grandpa's trunk. And I said, this is bullshit. I was, I didn't, sorry about my language. I said, man, that's my wife. I said, if we have a disagreement, it's nobody's business but our own. I said, if there is something up here, you show me right now. You show me right now. And there, I heard a noise. And dude, I get, look at the goosebumps on my arm just talking about it. But I heard a noise and there was a Cool Whip lid that was laying over there on the floor. And it was spinning like a coin and settling to the floor like like a coin does, you know. Man, I was out of there. And so uh, <laughs> I went after Melissa, and she's two or three blocks away at this point. And I picked her up in the car, and I'm like, I said, man, I, I that, that ghost, uh, it proved itself to me. I said, man, get in the car. And she's like, man, leave me alone. I'm, you know, I don't want to go nowhere with you right now. And I said, get in the car. This is important. I said, said, I believe you as well. Uh, said, yeah, I, said, yeah. I believe you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we went back in there and we went back up to the attic and I took a buckeye, you know, a regular old buckeye nut. And I put it on that chest and I said, okay. I said, I believe you. I said, uh, now I want, I want proof to show Melissa. I said, that's, uh, I said, I'm going to go downstairs. If I come back up and this is moved, we'll know you did it. And uh, I went downstairs and shut the attic door and all hell broke loose up there. And we were like, man, what the heck? And we went running back up the stairs and something had walked through all our boxes and just kicked them everywhere. And the Buckeye nut was still laying right there. Like it was like, uh, yeah, like it ruined screw everything the Buckeye the nut. Buckeye. I'm going to show you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> there was That's... nobody up there, man. It was a uh... so. So it destroyed everything else but the Buckeye nut. Just to say, yeah. I don't take, I don't, I don't take it, whatever it was. It had a lot of strength for ghost stuff, you know. Because uh, if it could do that, you know, it could, it could physically affect you, you know. And jeez, oh, yeah. I mean, this is some of the craziest stuff I've heard. I've ever heard. I mean, okay. that's oh, and well, well. I was starting to talk about the day I had friends over. And we're sitting there, sure. and Alyssa was gone that day, I think. I was just coming home when, yeah. at the end of this. And we had heard footsteps clomping around in the attic all night long. And it's like they were walking. You could hear them all the way from our bedroom to the front of the apartment, all the way over my neighbor's apartment, and all the way back, like it was walking in a big circle. And I've, I've already explained that there was stuff up there. You couldn't walk the attic like that. It was There was, there was yeah. no way to. And... Uh, um, I said, oh, my God. I said, that's that's the footsteps. I said, that's uh, that's the ghost up there. My buddies are laughing at me, man, and and giving me a hard time. And I said, no, I'm going to show you. And we went out there and I opened up the attic. Door. Right here okay. is right at this point. Something's happening to me, too. I'm coming home from work and I'm coming up the back stairs and I clearly hear somebody go, Melissa, Melissa. And I look around. There's nobody out in the hall with me. So I opened the door and I'm like, who called my name? And Gary and all of his friends are in the house and they all said, nobody called your name. We're, we're hearing the footsteps right now. We're hearing the footsteps up there. So I just wanted to interject that, that something was calling me as they're hearing all this. So, so. I, I went up the stairs and I went up there and turned the light on and, uh, and everybody came up there and I said, look, there's nobody here, man. There's nothing here. You could not walk around here the same as those footsteps were doing. And we looked for everybody just doors. like kind of laughing and still giving me a hard time. And so I, we went back downstairs and as I locked the attic door, I left the light on so I didn't have to go up there in the dark again. And uh, there was frosted glass in the attic door as well. And you heard these big footsteps go clunk, 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 clunk down the stairs right on the other side of that door. You could see light through that door now, and there was nobody there. And you could and hear my, him breathing. My, my friend said, I'm out of here, man. And down the front steps he went. And, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, he so, down the road. yeah, he wouldn't come back and never did. Yeah. Come back. So, so did you guys ever talk with the neighbors about this? Nobody else heard anything. We did interview and, the neighbors. It, yeah, nobody else had any stories whatsoever. But the difference is the lady next to us was an, an elderly lady that was retired. And uh, the guy downstairs on under her was a super quiet guy that worked nights. Never, you know, doesn't bother anybody. Kind of a reclusive guy. And the lady downstairs from us was a 75-year-old lady that wintered in Florida. So she was gone six months of the year. And we moved in, and we were young, and we were partying and raising hell a lot. And it, uh, yeah, I think maybe it didn't care for us being there in a way, if, if that makes any sense. Well, and it might be for the people on the bottom, hard to hear all the way up what's going on in the attic. It's plenty too. loud. Yeah, it was plenty loud. Now, so. interestingly <laughs> enough, um, I had contacted a guy in Marion that writes Spooky Marion. He writes the Spooky okay. Marion. Um, because I wanted him to do some research on the house. The only research that I could find was that one house was built by the uh, man named Sergeant, the streets named Sergeant. He built the other house as a wedding gift for his daughter. It was our Lord, Lord Alfred Tennyson built those houses as what I thought was the way that Well, worked. they're mere images of each other. Um, mm -hmm. And so he tried to get into it and he couldn't find any more information. But we, we published the story. Well, people came in and said, we heard there was a murder-suicide in that house. Yeah. That was the first thing I heard was a bunch two of men. A people responded. Was, a, was two men fighting in the attic. This is the very first thing I heard. And you could hear them arguing and fighting, and I could hear them wrestling, scuffling. I could hear their boots. And then all of a sudden, I hear like, Ugh, you know, like if somebody got hurt and a body hit the floor and somebody drag it across the attic floor. That and we heard that several times, somebody dragging something up there that we couldn't figure out. Well, you know. other people came through and reported the cigar smoke we would smell. Um, one lady said her aunt lived underneath her. They lived in our apartment and her aunt lived beneath them. And that their aunt would call them and say, could you guys please quit stomping around up there? And they'd be in bed. She's like, wasn't us. So she, so their aunt was hearing the activity, and they weren't. That's crazy. <laughs> so and it's it's funny because when we were young, we used to walk by that place every day, and I said, "One of these days, I'm going to buy that house for you." Because I thought they were mansions, and we were just, you know, talking and laughing about it. And then we ended up going to look at an apartment one day, and lo and behold, it was right it was there. there. We used to walk by every day. Well, you know, you, you kind of put it out there in the universe, and sometimes the universe uh, answers you whether you want to hear it or not. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, okay, so experiencing that versus seeing a Bigfoot walk it across the road, what what shakes you up more? By far the Bigfoot. Yeah. Really? By far the Bigfoot, yeah, because... Uh, I don't know. Spirits are spirits or usually don't have much ability to, to affect you physically. You know what I mean? I, I believe they're there. I've seen them enough strange stuff happen. And, you know, it's kind of like uh, if a book flies off the shelf and almost hits your wife in the head, you either need medication or that book flew off the shelf. You know what I mean? It's, uh, exactly. That happened. <laughs> <laughs> that happened. No. I had uh, had experiences with spirits my entire life from the time I was three. So that to me was normal. Bigfoot wasn't normal to me. You know what I mean? Now, before we, uh, cause I mean, we're, gosh, this is times just flew by before we end. Do you, do you guys want to talk a little bit about some, is there some stuff going on now at your place? Nothing, nothing special. Too, too dramatic. I think it's family that loves us basically i don't think there's anything here that's scary or it's interesting you know seeing it in the middle of the night sometimes the dark shadow things but yeah it yeah. used to be a, a game the kids played when they were younger to stand at the end of the hallway with your back to the hallway because it spooked them out so bad they couldn't hardly do it 
because you <laughs> see so much in the hall. For some reason, it seems to be that's where it's pinpointed is the hallway most of the time. And so but, you guys, you guys are seeing shadow figures and stuff. Moving yeah, around. pretty commonly. So to the point that. Uh, my nephew and I, for a while, it was just me and my nephew living here. I had COVID and I couldn't fly back to Washington. So my nephew was here helping take care of me. And we would constantly knock on each other's door. Were you just out in the hallway? Because we saw one day he swore he saw me. And see, that messes me up when it's my voice, when it's my image. And, and in the attic, uh, in the haunted house, we were just talking about his friend, Asked me one night, what would you come up to the attic for? He was sleeping up there, kind of hiding from the cops. <laughs> um, oh, boy. I, like I, I wasn't podcast. up in the attic last night. And he goes, no, when you popped your head up and you called me, he said, I'm sorry. I was just too, you know, he drank a few beers. He said, I was tired. I said, Jeff, I wasn't up in the attic. He goes, Melissa, I saw you plain as day walk up the attic stairs last night. <laughs> and see, that messes me up for some reason when it's my voice, when it's. Me, somebody is seeing. We would hear people taking a bath, you know, oh, in the bathroom. All the and, time. Yeah, and one day my friend Jeff, he's he was in there taking a bath. He stayed with us for a couple of weeks, and uh, uh, Melissa walked right in there, and he's like, "What are you doing? You can't hear the water running." And Melissa's like, "Oh, I always hear <laughs> stuff in this bathroom." I always hear somebody in there taking. <laughs> a bath. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so needless to say, you guys have experienced quite quite a lot of things that a couple shadow figures and some murmuring in the hallway isn't isn't going to scare you out of this house oh no, no. i think it never did scared out yeah i would have been scared out of the apartment I, I i do believe yeah if we'd had the money to move we'd have been gone because i was exhausted it wouldn't let me get any sleep the second you would go to doze off the closet door which is solid oak door would open and slam yeah, just that as was hard weird. as it could, and it latched good. We jerk on it and make sure this ain't just popping open. It would latch good, and we started bickering. And yeah, you had to turn the doorknob and pull it open and slam it to to do that. You know, it was because we were really just strange. exhausted. And Gary and I don't fight. That's a really rare thing. We just don't. We just get along. Um, so for us, we were getting exhausted to the point that we were bickering. You know what I mean? And for now, you have to understand. For a long time, he wasn't believing any of this. Yeah. I don't know what he thought. I was apologize. Going on, <laughs> but he wasn't believing any of this. Well, that's why that's why you guys have been married almost 40 years because he learned to say, I believe you. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I would never say that anymore. Now, <laughs> now we're so fine tuned that I can just say, uh, and, and maybe he'd do it for you since you can see him puff up. <laughs> just do it. Do it. Puff up. <laughs> I'm sitting down. Yeah, yeah. Now if I go, puff up, puff up, Gary. It means I've noticed Somebody's something looking dangerous around there. Yeah, so. I'm noticing something in our environment, and I need you to grow. And he can just make himself. I'm sure you could do the same thing. You said you're a big dude. You can just make yourself look bigger. No, I just look bigger no matter. I just look bigger no matter what. <laughs> I, I'm not pulling my shirt up for anybody. So there you go. <laughs> well, I, I I am so glad that you guys came on, Gary. That you made your first appearance, Melissa. I'm glad you came back. Um, it was great to talk to you again and hear these uh, hear these stories that you guys had. And I got to hand it to you, I'd have been scared of the apartment. That I ever we, would have through that too. Yeah, we did. We didn't have a choice though. We ended up I just know. getting used to it. We actually talked to him. That that's really what settled everything down. Yeah. We actually I, apologized. We we kind of figured what it was was that we were partiers, and one day we sat down and we said, <laughs> "Look, we apologize. We feel we're not taking good enough care uh, of your environment." But it's our environment, too. If you want to come in and watch TV, watch TV Turn at a down. normal level. <laughs> you know what I mean? Man, if you want a snack, get a snack. Don't leave my refrigerator door open. Let all my food spoil. And after we actually talked to it, uh, it didn't stop ever. But it did calm down to the it point where it moderated it. It wasn't so, trying to just scare us. It's like when I was in the attic, it, it heard what I said. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was yeah, sentient. It, 
it, you almost wonder if if whatever whoever whatever the spirit was if it felt like it was the rightful person living there and you guys were the ghosts intruding upon its ter- its territory it's another weird thing about that place is the closet door in the living room was this huge slab of oak like two and a half inches thick that was incredibly heavy and i'm like why isn't that on the front door you know but one day i was in there doing something and i realized there's this giant brass bolster that's like that big below the doorknob and uh at the bottom there's another plate that's about five by five that's it's got screw screw heads an inch across in it so they're sunk into the wood probably four inches i wouldn't doubt and uh i realized that the bar going across the closet was uh solid metal and you could lift that bar out and shut the door and barricade yourself in that closet. And, man, it would take an hour to get through it with an axe. You could barricade yourself into that closet like like nobody's business. I mean, you could not get through it. And the doorknobs were welded. So somebody made that closet into a little safe room of some type. Well, that's <laughs> why that's why I didn't take laps in downtown Marion when I was a kid. Right there. <laughs> there you go. Well, hey, thanks guys for, for coming on and sharing. These were great, great stories. I'm sure our listeners are gonna enjoy that. And I'm and I'm curious, I, I want to put it out there if anybody else has any stories from that military around that military base, Fort Lewis, right? Is that what you said it was? Yeah, Fort, Lewis. Fort Lewis. I'd love to hear from some more for some people that you know have some sightings around because we get a lot of sightings around military bases. So I'd love to hear, uh, love to hear some more stories from there. So, so thanks a lot, guys, and Thank you. Hey, stay, you. stay safe. Yes, sir. All Have right. a great you day. Too. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the From the Shadows podcast. Until next time, never shy away from the darkness or what may be lurking in the shadows. We are out. Ha 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 ha